um, C4 and C5 will do um, in the next week or so, in the next cu couple weeks. And then C6 and C7, we're going to try to finish today as well for HL. And then C8 as well. So it's not as much stuff as we really, um, as it appears to be, but um, we do still have to cover the stuff and make sure that we're ready for paper three. Um, if you didn't check the email, then um, you're probably, you may not be aware that we are going to be in this kind of format till at least April 13th, which includes our spring break. And so we're not having classes during spring break. Y'all are going to get a spring break. But these next two weeks, um, after, um, well, you have mock exams, mock exam schedule, um, tomorrow and then f Monday, but then on that Tuesday, um, we will resume normal class schedule. So there'll be three different sections of the class, um, that you can attend, um, for that. And so, um, it will be the normal class times, and so it'll be about 45 minutes except for the block schedule and stuff like that. So um, just a heads up about that um, for this. But so um, hopefully you all manage the Twitch stream. I've kind of stayed away from Google Meet just because it's a little hectic, and um, I know Twitch, and I'm familiar with it. And so I it's just easy. You just click on a link, and you can just watch. I think you do need an account to ask questions and stuff like that, but it's a free account to make. And so you're not going to be, um, it's not going to cost you anything. But so this is the format you're going to see the iPad, the graph and calculator on the top right in case we'll need to do some calculations later on HL and then my video feed at the bottom as well. Okay. And so I think I've given people enough time to hopefully get here. Um, we've got 46 viewers and so that's, significantly large um, section of the class and so um, SL won't need a calculator today no so um, you're good okay we will probably do SL maybe take a five minute break let HL kind of stretch out and walk around a little bit and then we'll come back um, for this but so um, I will record this and um, I will upload it to um, the YouTube um, this afternoon as well. So if you miss anything or you want to watch it back over, that will be um, on here as well. But so, okay. Now, let's kind of rewind a little bit and talk about kind of some of the basics of um, fusion and fission. We're not going to do Half-Life again. I think we covered Half-Life calculations all right, but just conceptually I want to kind of hit different things on here. But so the first thing with this Oops, sorry, I started writing fission and fusion at the same time, okay? So, a nuclear fusion reaction generally, again, is smaller um, nuclei combining to make larger nuclei. And so, something that might look like this might happen. So notice two hydrogen two isotopes forming a helium three isotope and then a neutron that's being produced more. And so the idea is this is that helium has a greater binding energy. And that's what all nuclear reactions do. Nuclear reactions are always the intent of either combining or breaking down nuclei so that you get greater binding energy. That's the binding energy curve that we saw on the Thursday before, um, or the Wednesday or Thursday before um, classes got out. And so um, that energy curve, that's what all fusion reactions want to do. Now, good news is you don't have to memorize any of these fusion or fission reactions specifically. They're not going to ask you to regurgitate one of them. But it might be somewhere where they give you the reactants and they have you predict the products or something like that. So that will be um, something that you do need to be aware of. Okay. And so um, a fusion reaction looks kind of similar to this. This is one example of a fusion reaction. Also, I forgot in Twitch, if you have a question, type question mark first, then I'll stop. It'll give you some time to write the question out um, while I'm waiting for that. 
And so um, just to give you a heads up and kind of the, the pace of the way things are going right now. But so here, okay, so um, pros of um, nuclear fusion. And we said this before, but I'm going to kind of outline again. I'm trying to follow the structure of the outline that I provided a little bit more closely today than I have in the past. And so if we repeat stuff, fine. Okay. Okay. One produces vast amounts of energy um, per gram. Okay. And so using one gram of deuterium or hydrogen two, that's what hydrogen two is called, um, can produce hundreds of thousands times as much energy um, than one gram of coal. So a significantly larger um, than a fossil fuel such as coal, which is which itself has a fairly good energy density or specific energy, I should say. Okay. Two. Okay. No greenhouse gases, okay? So directly speaking, helium is not a greenhouse gas, and so we don't um, – that's one of the definitely pros as well, okay? Also a pro, no radioactive waste, right? Nothing that's going to be decaying and releasing off radiation and forming um, harmful chemicals. But the problem is that we just don't – we can't harness it. So the, in theory, it's wonderful, and in theory, it's a great form of clean energy, but we're unable to harness it right now. And so right now, it's just kind of a pipe dream. But it does happen in the sun and in stars. Nuclear fusion is happening all the time. That's what kind of fuels the star to give off all the light that it does. And so – Something we talked about in some classes, and I don't think we talked about in other classes, was um, the atomic absorption spectrum. And so what happens is stars that um, are made of mostly gas clouds, they undergo fusion in their core and they're releasing all this light. But what happens in this core is it's surrounded by... these cooler gases. And so when the light leaves the um, leaves the core and is absorbed by those cooler gases, those cooler gases absorb certain um, frequencies of light. And so the light that comes out here is missing some um, light wavelengths. And those missing wavelengths help us identify the composition of the gases. So what you'll see is you'll see a full spectrum but it's missing some lines. And those lines relate to different elements that are found in the gases. And so scientists were able to determine, okay, this line is unique to sodium or this line is unique to hydrogen or unique to helium. So these gases must be contained in um, that star. And I think I have a better diagram here that I used in the past to kind of show this concept, if I can find it. I may just have to take it from one of the classes, but. Where is it? Hmm. Let's see. No, it should have been in here.
Okay, hold on. I'll steal it from another class. Because I started this in one of the classes and then I didn't get to it in another class. This is just another better, kind of a better drawn diagram to kind of explain the same thing. And so what you'll see here in the lines is dark absorption lines. And so those absorption lines correlate to the gases that are absorbing um, those wavelengths of light. And so um, with the sun, you'd see like gaps where hydrogen's lines would appear and maybe helium's lines would appear. Okay, so this these gaps occur because of absorption. Oops. Okay, so this is an absorption spectrum. Okay, there's a typo down here. Just ignore that. <laughs> I didn't notice that last time I took the picture. I'll use the picture. But so, um, yeah, when you absorb and you go, energy goes, the electrons go up, that's when that light's absorbed. Now, if you're asking, well, what happens when the electron comes down? The electron does release light, but the light goes everywhere, not in that same direction as the rest of the light, and that's why we still don't see it. So, like, that's why there's still gaps because, yes, technically the electrons give off light as they come down, but that light is emitted in all directions, so it's not concentrated enough to show up in this spectrum. So, that's just to kind of um, talk about that concept here. Nuclear fission, okay? Nuclear fission, we talked about before, is the breakdown of larger nuclei. Into two smaller nuclei, okay? And what we usually use for this is Uranium-235, okay? And so what happens here is uranium-235 absorbs one neutron and becomes 236 uranium. And that's really, really unstable. So what happens is then this breaks up into a couple of different isotopes. Okay, again, you don't need to memorize these equations or these reactions. You may be asked to fill in a missing um, species, so it's important that you understand how these reactions work and like how everything adds up and make sure you highlight the coefficients do matter. So this means three um, mass number in here. So that's why 236 equals 141 plus 92 plus 3 for the neutrons here. Okay. So no, you don't need to memorize this. You just need to remember that the um, the mass numbers and the atomic numbers must add up. So total mass number and atomic number must add up on both sides and be careful about coefficients as well. So more likely they'll give you a fusion, a fission reaction and leave one thing blank and ask you what the missing species is. They're not going to ask you to recite an entire uranium nuclear fission reaction. questions about that. I'm going to take a second and let y'all write that down and ask any questions.
Question. Yes, Aishini. Oh, so that's a good question, Aishini. Um, with this, it's kind of two reactions if you really want to think about it. You kind of want to think about it as this reaction and then this reaction. Um, and just for the record, Aishini, you don't actually have to spell out question mark. I just meant like type a question mark like that. It's faster than typing out question mark. But so it's really two reactions. But a lot of the times the IB will just kind of omit this and then go across. But I'm just showing you kind of what's happening here. So they might write it either way. Okay. Now, originally the, the concern was that um, – 235 uranium was originally thought to be scarce. Because in a sample of uranium, only 0.72% of it is usable Uranium-235, okay? So, of like a ton of, a metric ton of uranium, we're talking about, what, um, maybe like 7.2 kilograms in a ton of uranium. So, not a very large amount for that. So, scientists had to come up with alternatives. And um, what they came up with were called breeder reactions, breeder reactors, which converted uranium-238, which is the more abundant one, into plutonium-239. And plutonium-239 is fissionable, and it breaks down and releases a lot of energy as well. And so what happens is the uranium captures a neutron. And what happens is it converts those neutrons into protons to make a more stable um, species. And so it decays by producing this, and then this decays again. to do this. And so that's where your plutonium comes into play. I guess I, sh I shouldn't write this as beta because it's kind of confusing. It's really just an electron. Okay. Uh, Katrina. <sighs> that's a good question. I think if I were the IB, what they would probably do is have blanks in this set of equations because I don't think they want you to memorize these equations. So I think they would maybe have a blank in a couple of places and say, complete the nuclear reactions. and Or they might ask you as a conceptual thing, um, explain the function of breeder reactors. So you would say breeder reactors convert U-238, which is not fissionable, into... 239 plutonium, which is fissionable through beta decay. And then, then they use that to um, run their nuclear reactors. So I think that's how – those are two ways I think they would ask you about this. Okay. 
Okay. Now, there are cons with breeder reactors because breeder reactors sound very good. Because, like, well, if 90 something percent of the uranium is 238, well, then why don't you just use breeder reactors and make plutonium? Well, there are a couple of different things. Okay. One, Okay. Severely unreliable. They're expensive. And it turns out that the plutonium you make there, oops. Is actually weapons grade. Oh, sorry. Here. Or further. Here. Okay. So, one of the major cons is that the breeder reactors make weapons grade plutonium. And so, kind of hard to keep track of that. And countries would easily be able to convert that into nuclear weaponry if desired. And so, those are three of the big cons. And that's why a lot of countries have kind of gone away from breeder reactors. I don't think there are many breeder reactors left in the United States, um, specifically in here. So, um, but they are sometimes used. Um, yes, Eileen. I think um, that's a good question. I think the only con for nuclear fission is that we can't harness it right now. Like, it's just such an immense amount of energy that we aren't able to actually use it as a, f a fuel source right now. That's the big con. Really, in reality, if we could harness that, that could replace a lot of our fuel sources, um, a lot of our energy sources, and could probably power cities at a time. So, no, there really aren't any cons for nuclear fusion other than that fact that we can't harness it yet. That's really the big one. Oh, it's because weapons-grade plutonium is the fissionable plutonium. So it's not like – it's not like they <laughs> – how do I still explain this? Um, like I guess the concern is that maybe countries could say we're using breeder reactors and we're producing plutonium for this, but under, the, under that guise could actually be converting them into – weapons grade plutonium weapons so like the concern is that like a lot of these countries that are using breeder reactors might be yes yeah the nuclear fuel could be used as weapon instead of fuel exactly so countries are very wary of countries that have a lot of breeder reactors that have un that go unchecked with the amount of um plutonium they're producing yeah ginevra <sighs> Oh, um, because the only way it turns into plutonium is if you make the uranium-239 unstable, which then makes it decay to get the ratio back but to the correct amount to make plutonium. So uranium doesn't naturally turn into plutonium. It needs one more neutron before it starts degrading in that way. And so you have to add the neutron there first to become 239, and then 239 decays down to plutonium. That's why. Because the stability of the nucleus changes when you add an extra neutron. You're welcome. Oops, sorry. Let's see. I'll leave it. Oh, Tamor, what's up?
Yes, Tamar. It will be uploaded into YouTube, the same channel that it has been before. So if you miss something, um, you can um, you can go back and watch it. Yes. And the notes will be up on the Dropbox like usual as well. So, yeah, I um, you will be able to link it. I will try to remember to link it. I'll try to link each video in the Google Classroom as well in announcements so that you can kind of find it or there. Okay. Now. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I guess if they want to do that, they can. Um, but uh, that's that's their prerogative. Maybe I'll just wait like three or four days before I upload it and then like have a quiz before I upload the video. We'll see. Um, I should I'm doing fine. You know, like it's I'm healthy. I am um, self quarantine. Essentially, I'm like I'm at my house by myself. I don't have roommates and stuff like that. So it's just me in the house just doing things around the house and getting stuff ready for classes and things like that. And so um, but no, everything's fine. And, you know, it stinks and like, I'd rather be in class. Um, but, um, I will, um, I have downloaded that and I will, I will play that later on. But so let's not talk about that right now in a stream that's supposed to be chemistry, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I need to do some cleaning as well, but you know, it's, it's an unfortunate set of circumstances, but we adapt, we move on. Um, and so well, I'll be fine. And this is, this is normal for me. Like I, every year I do tutoring like this through Twitch already with my seniors. So this is not nothing new to me. It's just, I hate that this is the only way that we're able to do this stuff. Okay. So next thing, disposal of nuclear waste. Oh, did I say 18th? I said the 18th instead of 19th, right? It's okay. I'll change it. Don't worry. Um, I'm not going to change it now. I'll just, I'll change it in the um, upload. Okay. Disposal of nuclear waste and storage, I guess as well. Okay. Now there's two levels of nuclear waste that we have to worry about. Okay. The first is what's called low level waste. Okay, and that is materials exposed to, oops, radioactive material. So things like gloves, tools, um, soil, um, rock. Um, I guess like animals as well <clears throat> that have been exposed to radioactive material. Okay. So we call it low level cause we're kind of essentially like we're talking about low level exposure and low level threat of kind of damage as well. So with low level stuff, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. Okay. One, you store in landfills um, until safely decayed okay and then you dispose of as ordinary waste so you keep it on site in a landfill or something like that and then when it is safely decayed, then you dispose of it in the trash or um, as waste. Okay. Two. It can be incinerated. It can be burned. Okay. Um, oops. Yes. I think that's clear.
I'm not sure I understand your question. Like, I don't think those animals... Like, unless those animals were being eaten and things like that, I think they just allowed those animals to kind of live out their life. And a lot of them probably from enough radiation. Did they really shoot the dogs? I didn't. I didn't know that. I guess the ones that wandered too much. I didn't know about that. I didn't know they shot the dogs. But, um, oh, in the, in the drama documentary they did? Well, I mean... You, you kind of have to think about, like, you don't want that to spread and, um, oh, yeah, yeah, not being tested on. Yeah, in that case, yeah, sorry. Like, Katrina's right. These are the, the animals that were nearby the explosion that were radioactive and things like that. And we'll talk about kind of the effect of radiation poisoning and stuff like that. Yeah, you don't want to eat any cows or any meat that's radioactive, so they probably just... Um, eliminated those to prevent anyone from being tempted to um, try to consume them or anything like that or have that stuff spread because radiation poisoning can can be exponentially increased yeah but that radiation is is not like uranium that radiation is kind of like sterilization radiation and things like that that we use to sterilize to get to disinfect like from bacteria and stuff like that so they're not shooting uranium on this food and stuff like that it's mostly kind of uv radiation and stuff like that okay okay so incinerated ashes then assessed and determined what's great about incineration is it really reduces the volume of um waste Higher activity, low level waste is usually buried in um, underground storage. Okay. Usually in concrete containers. or concrete lined vaults. So they are, they're not just buried in the soil. They are in concrete containers, concrete vaults that prevent the radiation from escaping and affecting around there. And sometimes this can be up to 500 years. Oops. For some of this stuff before it kind of becomes safe. Okay. High level waste essentially the spent fuel rods, any um, I don't know, transuranic products, which are like species um, above uranium. So things like that, 239, plutonium, things like that. Um, and other fission products. That's our high level waste. So this stuff is the actual stuff that really emits a lot of radiation and it is fairly dangerous. Um, and so they have to come up with um, specialized ways to dispose of that. Okay. The first way... is vitrification okay and so what they do is they reprocess uh, nuclear fuel 
into a liquid. Then encapsulate it in glass. Okay. So they liquefy it and then they mix it into glass and then they store it that way. So it makes storage easier because it's kind of compacted in there and the glass itself kind of prevents it from releasing too much radioactive, I mean, radiation. Let me see what I can find. So like what you see here, let me see if I can find a good picture of it. So like this stuff here has kind of radiation, um, radioactive material kind of stored inside it. And so it kind of prevents it from kind of emitting radiation and stuff like that. Now, the stuff that you see that's vitrified, like that's kind of out and about, isn't uranium. It's other kind of weaker um, radioactive material, but that's the kind of what you do. So turn it into glass, ceramics and things like that. Yeah, so... You talk about this, and so, like, I don't know if they have a good picture here. So they're melting it down, and then, um, I was trying to see. Yeah, they're, they're chemically bound in the glass material, um, so it, it's less likely to be kind of dangerous there. Two, okay, storage underwater, um, to allow dissipation. So you, you store these spent fuel rods in a kind of cooling pond, like it's a self-contained man-made lake where they storm at the bottom. And so the water kind of absorbs the radiation and prevents it from like damaging anything else. And so those kind of cooling ponds that we talk about there. Okay. Okay. Which then once that happens, then they're stored in casks or reprocessed chemically. So I would know what low level and high level waste, what things fall under those categories, and then probably one way to dispose of each of them. Like if I'm the IB, I would say state an example of low level waste and describe one method of disposal or state um, examples of high level waste and then one method of um, one method of disposal for that. That's that's kind of what I think the IB would do. Sorry, I'll leave that there for a second. <laughs> I know HL is going to hate this, but we're almost done with the SL stuff. We have a couple more things to talk about, and then we'll probably be done. Zena, question. Um, yeah, Zena, I mean, um, I can put it up. I mean, I'll tell you which one it is like, um, oh, I forgot which one I use now. I think I use like, I mean, I'll, I'll upload all the 2019 ones in there and you can do that for practice. Yeah, that's fine. Um, 
And so I think I used like May 2019 time zone two for paper one and then time zone one for paper two or something like that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put those up next week so y'all can practice that. If you're someone that is wanting to take that as a real mock exam and you take it as a real mock exam and you want me to grade your paper two, I'm more than happy to kind of look at that as well. If you want me to go, Ms. Strong, I want you to score like a moderator and tell me what I would have gotten. I'm more than happy to do that. Okay, Katrina, for the storage underwater, does the, doesn't that have other ecological issues like on the environment? Well, that's what I was saying. The thing is that this isn't like a lake that's naturally occurring. It's a concrete lined, like man-made lake that's in the nuclear facility. So it, it doesn't go anywhere else. And so like it is kind of separated from everywhere else. And so it is kind of um, separated from the rest of the environment theoretically um glass uh <laughs> we're working on i'm working on those too maria um i'm um i'm gonna get those back to you um hopefully this weekend so that way we can have google meets and talk about your ias and let y'all work on it for a couple weeks and then i'll take your finals and i'll grade them okay um, what about the glass and water make it good at containing radiation? Um, water is just kind of um, a fairly dense molecule that kind of absorbs a lot of radiation before it can kind of pass through the lake. Glass, I think it's more of a kind of refractive thing where it bonds the silicon in there. And so any radiation that's kind of being given off um, is less so when it's bonded in there and also anything that's given off i think the glass structure itself kind of prevents it from going in a concentrated direction somewhere it's kind of mostly internally contained okay chloe That's, that's a really good question, Chloe. I don't think you actually dispose of it. I think you just kind of continually, like it's stored in there for a long period of time. So I don't think you're actually ever disposing of it. That pool of water is just always going to be radioactive. And so even after you got rid of all the fuel rods and stuff like that, you'd have to wait a long time before the water stopped being radioactive. I think that's the thing. Okay, Max, question. Okay, I think everyone's written this down. That's, I am not sure. That's a really good question because I don't know the answer to that question. I think the amount of water in that cooling pond is so large that um, that even it, like relative to the amount of fuel that's being put in there to cool, I think a lot of the radiation that's absorbed dissipates before more of it's released, I guess. So I don't think the water, like the amount of water they have there is enough to absorb the radiation at least, and it's kind of a process where the radiation starts to break down and break down and break down. And then um, the water then absorbs more and stuff like that. So I'm not exactly sure about that. Okay, last thing here, okay? Um, problems associated with nuclear power slash fission. Okay, really fission because we can't use fusion right now. So when they say nuclear power, it's Im implied that it's just nuclear fission, okay? 
One, health issues. Okay, so you have things like radiation poisoning, cancer, and birth defects in children. So most employees are kind of monitored to their radiation exposure. They usually have like a little tag. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but usually on their, um, their um, uniforms, they have this tag that has a radiation sensor on it. And when it changes to a certain color, they're being exposed to too much radiation. They have to leave. I think, let me see if I can find that. Um, so radiation tag. Maybe a tag is what I want to look for. Oops, that did not. I don't know if I can find it. I thought, like, usually they have, like, a tag or device that they wear that kind of changes color and things like that. But I can't find it right now. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it is a long – because your body does hold on to it. And so it's it's a very difficult process to kind of purge yourself of that. Okay, two. Okay. Okay. Nuclear meltdown, okay? So if reaction goes out of control, um, the reactor could be damaged and nuclear fuel and waste could be released. Okay. And so, yeah, if reaction goes out of control, like in Chernobyl, like at um, Fukushima in Japan, um, the reactor is damaged, a crack happens in the reactor, and then fuel starts leaking out into the environment and waste and things like that. And the last thing we also talked about um, was um, nuclear weaponry. Because um, breeder reactors produce plutonium-239, which is used in military-grade weapons. And so apparently there's are, there are hundreds of tons of um, plutonium being stored in non-military um, manners at different like um, reactors and things like that. But you only need a, a few kilograms of plutonium before you can actually make an ex a bomb um, explosion. So there is kind of the threat of someone being able to take that plutonium that's available and um, and convert it into military grade weapons and things like that. So kind of big issues with nuclear power fission health issues, nuclear meltdown, nuclear weaponry um, are, the, are the big things. And so those were the things they would ask you to list. Remember I told you a lot of the options are a lot of lists and this is kind of one of those other lists of talking about nuclear fission here. Okay. Questions. Okay. Oh yeah, Katrina. Do 
do you mean like do you have to cite a specific example of a health issue or a nuclear meltdown? I don't think so. But I think if you said the things that we listed here, I think that would be sufficient. Like radiation poisoning or nuclear meltdown, weaponry. I think this is general enough. Like you, I don't think you need to say Chernobyl. I don't think you need to say Fukushima and things like that. I think these kind of general things are what they're looking for. Okay. All right. That is the end of SL for today. HL, we're going to talk about um, actually calculating um, the amount of energy that's being released by these fission reactions. And we're going to talk about how we actually refine and enrich plutonium, I mean uranium. And then we're actually going to talk about um, what happens with the um, chemical reactions that cause health problems. And so we're going to take a five minute break right now. And then uh, we will con resume this. This, I don't know how long it's going to take, so I'm not going to make any guarantees about um, how long this is going to take for HL. But uh, we will start in about five minutes. So take a break, go get something to drink, use the restroom, and then we'll be back in five. You're welcome. Y'all have a good day.
get back in here. And we will uh, resume back with our um, HL chemistry here. Okay. Now, with HL, we actually have to calculate the energy produced um, in nuclear reactions. Okay. And that difference is known as what's called the mass defect or delta M for abbreviation. It is the difference in mass between the nucleus and the individual nucleons. Nucleons being protons and neutrons. So it turns out that what happens is when nucleons come together to form a nucleus, they give off a bunch of energy. And that energy is from the change in mass. So the mass of a neutron or a proton separately is heavier than a mass or a neutron that is that that sorry that that is the sum of the mass of the nuclei once it's combined together and so that's called the mass defect and so the difference in mass of individual nucleons compared to the mass of the nuclei or the nucleus that difference is the mass defect and that difference is what releases energy and because using einstein's equation e equals mc squared we can figure out the energy that's released from that mass defect. Okay, now, information you need to know from um, the data booklet. Okay, the data booklet tells you that one atomic mass unit is equal to 1.66 times 10 to negative 27 kilograms. It also tells you that one proton is equal to 1.672622 times 10 to negative 27 kilograms, and one neutron is equal to 1.674927 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So this is all given to you in the um, the data booklet. Okay. I'll let you get a chance to write that down. So for example, let's calculate the mass defect of a helium nucleus. A helium nucleus has an atomic mass of, if we look at the periodic table, I forget if it's, um, let me see exactly what it says here, um, data packet. So, sorry, let's see, helium is 4.00. Okay, so we'll use that mass. So is 4.00 AMUs, atomic mass units. Because we're talking about one atom of helium right now, okay? And so if that's the mass, if we multiply that, oops, sorry, by 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, we can figure out what that mass is. So going into the calculator here, you do four, oops, got to turn it on. Four times 1.66 second E negative 27. And I get 
6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Is everyone able to follow that so far here? Okay, and it has a question. Put a question mark in the chat, and then I will kind of clarify. Okay, yes, Claire. Yes, sure. So, if I want to figure out the mass in kilograms of the helium nuclei, I'm going to take the mass in AMUs, the atomic mass unit, and convert that to kilograms. So, since there's four AMUs in a helium atom, because I use that from the periodic table, if I multiply by 1.66 times 10 negative 27 kilograms, then I know the mass of my nucleus here is 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So I'm just multiplying my AMUs of a nuclei times what one AMU is equivalent to. Okay, now that helium has two protons and two neutrons. So the mass of a proton is 2 times 1.672622 times 10 to the negative 27 plus two neutrons which is 1.674927 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So I'm going to type that in my calculator right now. Plus 2 times 1.74927. And I get a mass of 6.695098 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So that's my mass of the individual protons and neutrons that make up that nuclei. And notice that there is a difference between those values. That difference is the mass defect. So the mass defect is delta M is equal to 6.695098 times 10 to the negative 27 minus 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27. So this minus gets me 5.5098 times 10 to the negative 29th. Kilograms. That's my mass defect. Now, if I take that number and I put it into E equals mc squared, my energy will equal 5.5098 times 10 to the negative 27, 9, sorry, negative 29 kilograms times the speed of light squared. And so this times 3.0 second E8 squared gets me 4.96 times 10 to the, I think this is two zeros, times 10 to the negative 12th joules per atom. So this would be 4.96 times 10 to the negative 15th kilojoules per atom.
Now, that doesn't seem like very much, but that's per atom. Okay, what is this? Oh, okay. So, Claire, this energy is the energy that's released when the nuclear reaction happens. Because that difference between mass effect, that mass defect, sorry, not mass effect, mass defect, is how much energy that's released in the nuclear reaction. So, a fusion reaction that produces a helium atom like this would produce that much energy per atom. <laughs> okay, so, but we don't really care about per atom. We want per mole. Okay, so how would we figure out our kilojoules per mole of atoms? How would we figure out how much energy we need, how much energy is produced if we have a mole of high, um, helium um, um, atoms? How would we figure out how much energy per mole? If that's the energy per atom, Okay. Um, this energy does change. So uh, it doesn't say constant. So you are going to have to figure out the mass defect every single time. You can't just say it's always this every single time. You do need to calculate the mass defect because it will vary. But how many atoms are in a mole? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So if we take this energy and we multiply it by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, that gets us 2.985 times 10 to the 12th kilojoules per mole that is a huge amount of energy that fusion could be producing if we were able to harness it because just to give you an idea one mole of carbon only produces 394 kilojoules per mole. So a significantly larger amount of energy in fusion um, for that situation. questions about that uh, question do we give our final answer moles or atoms that's a good question you'll really want to pay attention to what they ask you in the problem so be wary of the units. If they ask you per molar per atom, that's going to be um, something important that you should be aware of. So um, just keep that in mind um, for this. Another question?
Oh. Yes, Chloe. Uh, this would not be a part one. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about paper three. This would be a part two question of paper three. It's in the options. So the option in paper three, this is all option stuff. This is not um, core material. So this would be in the short answer part. There's no multiple choice for the option. The first part's lab procedure and the second part's the option, which is energy. It's okay. <clears throat> okay. I feel like Pancetta, Pancetti and Machetti had another question. Oh, Miriam. Oh, that's just a correction on the question before. Okay, Miriam, question. Oh, okay, sweet. <laughs> That's the best. Okay, up, oh, Doris. Uh, I think it's your. Oh, Danielle. Sorry, there's two D's. I forgot. Thank you, Danielle. I forgot. Um. What part is pixelated? Is it the webcam itself? I don't know why my webcam is not. I don't know. I have it as max resolution. So. Sorry, Danielle. Okay. It might, yeah, it might just be your, um, it might be your, um, it might be the quality of your Twitch stream. You can upgrade the quality of the Twitch stream as well to different levels. It may be like at 360 or 480. But if you go to 720p or higher, it'll be faster. Sorry, Danielle. Okay. Now, this works for fusion and fission alike. Okay. For fission, you might see something like this. Okay, 23592 uranium plus 10 neutron yields 14156BA plus 9236 krypton plus 310N. And they'd have to give you some information, so don't freak out about this, but what they'd probably tell you is that 235 uranium has a mass of 235.043923 AMUs and then 141BA would have a, um, a more accurate mass of 140.914411 AMUs um, and Krypton would have a mass of 91.926156 AMUs. Like they would tell you that information. Now we already know that one neutron is equal to, I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's 1.674927. 1.674927 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. Okay, so with that information, and then we have one AMU is equal to what 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms so with all that information we can convert all of these values into kilograms
and then ninety one point nine two six one five six times oops equals one point five two five nine seven four one nine times ten to the negative twenty five kilograms. Okay. So it is products and reactants. So you've got to figure out all the reactants first. So we'll do the reactants here in red. So the reactants are 3.9017291 times 10 to the negative 25th plus 1.674927 times 10 to the negative 27th. minus the other values here, 2.33917922 times 10 to the negative 25th plus 1.5259741 times 10 to the negative 25th plus three times 1.674927 times 10 to the negative 27th. So now I've got to see if I can, okay, this plus enter plus point six seven four nine two seven. So this side is 3.9184783. Thank you for the sub at Amir. I almost said Adnan. Sorry, Amir. Okay. Minus the other side, which is this number plus this number plus three times 1.6474927. Oops. Did I do something wrong? So what did I do wrong? That plus that plus three times. Oh, I just have a random parentheses there that I don't need, I don't think. Okay. 3.91457819 times 10 to the negative 25th. Take those numbers. and subtract, and you get a mass defect of 3.9002 times 10 to the negative 28th kilograms. Thank you, Panchetti Machetti. I don't know, I think that's Poncho. I'm not sure, that's the closest guess I can think of to that. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. So that's our mass defect. So then our energy per atom is 3.9002 times 10 to the negative 28th times 3.00 times 10 to the eighth squared. So that energy is 3.51 times 10 to the negative 11th joules per atom. And I would say that they usually want it in kilojoules per mole because that's more comparable. So this would be 3.51 times 10 to the negative 14th kilojoules and multiply by 0, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd to get the actual kilojoules 
per mole. So divide by 1,000 and multiply by 6.02, oops, 02. And you get 2.11 times 10 to the 10th kilojoules per mole. Um, I think, to be honest with you, I think the IB will shorten it and truncate a lot of it. This is just an example problem I took from another like practice book. So, Danielle, I would assume that they'll probably just go to two or three. Like, if you look at a question, let's see. Um, let me find, for example, if you look at a question, sorry, let me look back here. Um, If you look at a question from a, um, a paper three, I think I was looking at one for this. We'll talk about this format a little bit later, but um, so if you look at the mass effect, mass defect, I keep saying mass effect, mass defect equation here. Uh, actually, this one doesn't have it. I thought this one had it. Uh, let me find one that actually, I think I'm trying to figure out one, one that actually had it. Because that one was a fusion defect. I thought that one was a uranium defect. Let me see. Nope, it doesn't it doesn't have this one for mass defect. Is this higher level? Let me check one more and if I can't find it. Um uh, but yeah, I think the numbers will be a bit shorter than they are in this example problem. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, it looks like Um, it looks like you are going to have a lot of decimals there because these are such small amounts, Danielle, that you are going to ha have to carry about, out a bunch of decimals. Sorry. Do you have to write all the decimals down? No, you can just store them in your calculator. Just make sure you carry them, follow them through in your calculator. Okay. Hope that answers your question. Okay, so that is mass defect, and that's understanding how to um, separate those apart. Okay, now, okay, we're halfway through the material. Maybe we'll get done before 12. Okay, now, one of the things I said before, and we'll write this here. This is a new section called uranium enrichment. Okay. So like we said before, uranium-235 is only 
of all uranium. And usually you need about 3% U-235 um, to be considered fuel. Okay. For weapons, you need about 90% of it, your enriched uranium. So there is a distinct difference between that. So if a country is enriching uranium to a high, high percentage, that's usually a sign of them designing, developing nuclear weapons because you don't need that high percentage to make a effective nuclear reactor. So there is a big enough difference there that you can tell when a country is trying to make nuclear weapons versus a country is just making nuclear energy. Whereas with plutonium, all plutonium is useful. And so it'd be a, it'd be easier to kind of mask that. But so, um, what we have to do is a two-step process. Okay. Oh, let me put the chat up here so I don't have to keep looking over to the right. Let's see. Chat. Okay. So, it's a two-step process. Okay. One, convert uranium into a gas. Okay. Now, what happens here is that we have to convert that uranium ore that we usually get, which is UO2, into a gas known as uranium hexafluoride. Okay. And so converting that here requires a couple different steps, but we're not going to necessarily get into um, that too much here. It's just you need to know that it converts from UO2 using hydrogen fluoride gas to produce that. I don't think you need to know that reaction um, for this. And so we won't go into the details here, but we do want to talk about the fact that they have different characteristics. Okay. And so these, you do need to know about each of these, um, compounds. Okay. You uranium four oxide. Okay. Is a dark brown crystalline ionic solid. Okay. It melts at over 2800 degrees Celsius. Okay, so ionic bonding here. So it's difficult to break apart the uranium from this. And so when you expose it to hydrogen fluorine gas, the oxygens are replaced by fluorines. And so then you make uranium hexafluoride, which is UF6, okay? And so it sublimes at 64 degrees Celsius. Oops, I wrote 65, but I meant 64. Which means it goes from a solid to gas, and that's what you want, a gas. Okay? It's octahedral because it has six charge centers. And it is a covalent molecule. So it has... weak LDF forces, which means you can separate the molecules very easily apart. The gas molecules can separate apart fairly easily. A very low kind of melting point and boiling point. And that idea here is what allows us to then separate the uranium hexafluoride because some of that uranium hexafluoride is 235 uranium and some of that uranium hexafluoride is 238. And so then we have to learn how to separate that. Oops, let me change color here. Okay. 
So separation techniques. And this is a little bit of math involved as well, sorry. The first separation technique is what's called di gas diffusion. Okay. It turns out that U-235 F6 is slightly lighter than U-238 F6, which is true because it has three less neutrons, okay? That difference in mass means a higher velocity at the same temperature. And so one of the things that we can use um, I'm tutoring IB chemistry for the option for energy. So I'm, I'm teaching my class. I don't know who Aaron D is, but yeah, that's what we're working on. We're working on option C. Okay. So gas diffusion. Okay. And this depends on, I know it's called gas diffusion, but it's, it's dependent on Effusion, okay? Effusion is the rate at which a molecule escapes. <laughs> All right, no problem, Aaron. You're welcome to stay. Rate at which a molecule escapes through a small opening in a container. So rate at which a, small, a molecule escapes through a small opening container. So what you want to think about is, let's see, imagine a box. Uh, let's see, that's not a box. Here. And imagine that there's a small opening here. Well, the particles are constantly moving around in the container. Now, eventually, some of those particles will escape through that small opening. And the probability of that molecule escaping is higher when the particles are moving faster. So rate of effusion is higher when particles move faster. Now, you don't actually have to measure the rate of effusion, like a speed. What you do is you compare the rate of effusion of two species um, based on their mass because there is a, a law for this, and that is called Graham's Law of Effusion. And it's given to you in your data packet, but I'm going to explain to you how it's derived. Okay. So... The speed of a particle is based on its kinetic energy. And so let's say we have, let's say, gas one and gas two. Well, each of them have their kinetic energy. Oh, sorry, I should write the squared here. Okay. Now, if they're at the same temperature, these two values have to be the same. Okay. Now, let's reorganize this equation to kind of show you where Graham's Law of Effusion comes from. Well, the halves cancel out because they're both the same on each side. And so what we do 
is we are rearranged equation so that v1 squared over v2 squared is equal to m2 over m1. And then we square root both values. So this becomes v1 over v2 equals the square root of m1 over m2. And what that is saying is that the velocity ratio is proportional to the square root of the mass ratio. So the bigger the difference between the masses, the bigger the difference between the speed of the uh, particles. Because you're comparing how fast one travels than the other. Oh, Poncho, question. Oh, because they're at the same temperature. Remember, kinetic energy is reflection of temperature. So if you're at the same temperature, then the kinetic energies are equal. Sorry if I didn't say that earlier. You're welcome. So if you take the masses of two things, and so what we're going to plug in here is molar mass instead of just mass. So we can apply this to gas one, which is U235 F6. And then gas two, which is oh, 238 F6. Okay, let me, let me just calculate this kind of roughly here. Um, let's see, where's my calculator? Okay, so 230, oops, 235 plus six times, it's just 19 exactly, right? I should know this off the top of my head. Um, should I have my periodic table out? Um, Yeah, it's 19, essentially. So, plus 6 times 19 is 349. And this would be 352. Thank you, Hobo Red, for the Twitch Prime sub. Okay. <laughs> so, if I wanted to find out how much faster... gas one is, I would plug in these numbers. I would say V1 over V2 is equal to square root of gas two, which is 352 over 349. So 352 divided by 349 and then square root that is it is 1.004 times faster. So gas one is that much faster than gas two. So it's not a huge difference, but it's enough to allow us to separate that out. So this number here relates to this. And I always make gas one the lighter one. That way I always get a number larger than one. So um, when you plug it in, plug the heavier one as gas two, lighter one as gas one. Therefore, you always get a number greater than one. So how do we take advantage of that? Well... In very simple terms, what they do is they have this kind of machine. Okay. And 
and they pump a mixture of UF6 gas at high pressure going through here. And what they have here, oh, Claire, question. Will they show us an image of this and expect us to be able to interpret it? No. <laughs> I think this is like, no, I don't think they're going to draw have you draw this out. I just want you to kind of understand what's happening here. So this is being pressed, pushed through on the bottom. Now, there are small openings here. And because uranium... Oops, sorry. I'm trying to make this slightly more 235 UF6 will effuse. And so, oops, sorry. So this will be slightly enriched. So a little bit more of the UF6 235 will come up. Now some of the some of the UF6 238 will still come up. Like it's not perfect here. So because it's such a small difference, you must run this hundreds of times. to enrich. Okay, so you have to keep recycling it over and over again, pressing it through, having some of the UF6 kind of effuse up and then pass through, collect that, run it through again, effuse up, run it through again, run it through again, hundreds of times before you actually have increased that percentage of UF6 to usable. So you have to do this a bunch of times. So it's a huge cycle that they just keep feeding over and over and over again until all the UFs until enough UF6 is removed from it. So that's gas effusion. So I would know how to calculate the comparison and rate, and I'd also understand kind of how generically this works, that we use that fact that it fuses faster to push it through a membrane. The second way, is that right? Oh, we'll call it B. Sorry, I should have looked back here. Is gas, oops, gas centrifugation, really hard word to say. But the idea here is that, remember, centrifuging, oh, sorry, a centrifuge uses the densities of, of substances to separate through spinning. So what happens here is that when you spin it, when you feed the gas into the container and it spins around really, really fast, okay? So let's say you feed UF6 into this container that's spinning really, really fast, okay? Which species will be pushed to the outside of the container. 
okay? Which ones, as you spin, will be pushed further out, okay? Those are the heavier ones. Sorry, I probably should give you all a chance to answer that, but the heavier ones, okay? And so this is pushed out. The 238s are heavier, pushed out to the outside. And the U235 stays in the center. And then we can extract that from there. So you spin it really, really fast. The U-238 gravitates toward the outside because it's heavier. The U-235 stays slightly more in the center. We extract, we recycle, keep doing it, keep doing it over and over again until it is separate. So it's kind of like the way you would separate platelets and blood, right? You spin it really, really fast. The, uh, the platelets that are more dense kind of go toward the outside, the liquid stays kind of in the middle, and then you kind of remove that and you spin it more, remove that, kind of spin it more. And so you're using the densities to separate based on kind of momentum. Questions? Again, like Claire asked earlier, I wouldn't expect you to, I don't think they would expect you to draw this. They just kind of expect you to like know what is happening with that. Like, like they might just say state one technique to enrich uranium. So you would say, well, gas centrifuge spins the sample of uranium really fast and the 238 uranium goes toward the outside and you collect the U-235 in the middle. Or you might say gas effusion where you pump high pressure gas and it, the lighter stuff passes through a membrane and then you're able to collect it that way and enrich so know the general idea of each single um kind of separation technique questions about that we're almost done good news we're almost done we're probably about maybe five or ten minutes left So one of them, that's a good question, Never. I don't see anything here that is um, saying that you one is more efficient. They're both um, require a lot of different repeating of the the technique, and so I know there's not one that's more efficient than the other one. Okay, two more bits. I'm assuming that was her question for the one before, so we're going to move on. Okay. So, okay. So, Radioactive decay is a first order process, which means the time it takes to have the rate is the same every single time. So it doesn't matter how much radioactive material you have, it will take the same amount of time to split in a half. So the half-life stays constant, which is useful for us for carbon dating, for disposal of waste and things like that. Because could you imagine that if you got less and less that the half-life extended, then you wouldn't be able to really predict how much um, – It'd be very difficult to kind of anticipate like lengths of times, things like that. And so here we're just talking about one thing here. And um, it's the idea of activity, which is symbolized by A. Activity is, um, let's see. Actually, no, let's see. Okay. The number of nuclei that decay 
per unit time. Okay, so what this relates to is A is equal to lambda um, times um, the number of particles here. So it's really not talking too much about this, but n is the n is the initial. Okay. And so then you can figure out how many are decaying per um and this is your decay constant. That lambda before. So if you think about it, that makes sense because your number of nuclei is like, oh, Mofe, question. So activity is essentially your rate. Okay, yeah, one second. I'll explain that in a second. So, essentially, decay constant is 1 over time, and n is number of nuclei, so then A ends up equaling nuclei over time. So that's just your rate. So just know that you could figure out the rate um, of the reaction by this. To answer Mofe's question... Um, what they do is this. So carbon dating takes the idea that carbon-12 doesn't decompose, but carbon-14 does. That's the radioactive version of carbon. So we know how much carbon-14 there should be with X amount of carbon-12. So when we take a sample of carbon from a fossil or for something that's very, very old, we know how much carbon-12 is there. So that we can figure out how much carbon-14 there should be there. And then we measure how much carbon-14 actually is there. And the amount that it's decayed by tells us the approximate date of it. So let's say there's supposed to be one gram of carbon-14 in your sample if it was fresh. But the sample you have has only half a gram. That means it's undergone one half-life. So therefore, that thing has been decomposed for one half-life of carbon-14, which is about 5,700 years. So if the amount of carbon-14 is now half of what it should be, then it's gone through one half-life. If it's a quarter, then it's two half-lives. So it's about 11,000 years old. And three half-lives, 16,000 years old. So with that kind of concept, that's how we're able to carbon date something. I hope that answered your question. So we're able to figure out how much carbon-14 there should be there, and we can measure how much actually is there. And that difference tells us that number of half-lives it's gone through. Because carbon-12 doesn't decay. No problem. Last thing. This is kind of a separate thing as well. Sorry, this last bit doesn't really connect to each other. Now, in SL, we talked about how radiation could negatively affect human health and things like that, but we didn't talk specifically about it. And so what we want to talk about here is ionizing radiation can damage human cells and damage DNA. Okay. So the DNA effect can either damage directly or it produces free radicals which then damage the DNA.
Okay. Now, one of the issues is that water is one of the most abundant species in our body. And what can happen is that with water, it can be ionized from the radiation. Okay, and that's a positively charged H2O. And then that electron can react with another H2O to produce an H free radical and an OH minus. I wouldn't memorize these reactions. I'd write them down, but I'll tell you what you really need to kind of focus on here. And that H2O plus will react with an H2O to form H3O plus and an OH free radical, not an OH ion, an OH free radical. This is called a hydroxyl free radical. So that hydroxyl free radical is what damages DNA. Okay. And then also it can attack enzymes and lipids in cells as well. Yes, Ginevra. Um, no, I would say the hydrogen free radical doesn't really do anything in that case. Most likely, um, uh, I'm thinking that hydrogen free radical, where would it go? I'm trying to think of where that would go. It is still a free radical. I would say the hydrogen free radical still has an effect, but it's not specifically like it's a generic free radical that can damage cells and things like that. So I wouldn't necessarily know the, the main things about that because the IB specifically states you need to know two free radicals in this. One is the hydroxyl free radical and then the other one is this, which is called the superoxide ion. When oxygen reacts with an electron to form this um, superoxide. So your job here is to know that nuclear energy, the ionizing radiation can form free radicals such as hydroxyl and superoxide ions. And those free radicals can damage DNA and living cells. So I don't think they're going to make you write these equations out. I think you really want to emphasize the production of these two free radicals. That's the thing. Like this would be a short answer, like one mark question saying state and explain st – or two mark questions. State and explain how ionizing radiation is harmful to your health. So you would say, well, ionizing radiation – can react with water and oxygen to produce hydroxyl free radicals or superoxide ions, which then in turn damage DNA or attack enzymes and lipids. That's kind of the answer I think they, they want, want would want for this. You're not going to have to write reactions out for these things. Questions?
Oh, Sabrina. Ionizing radiation is just radiation given off by the um, the radioactive um, material. Yes. Yeah. The superoxide essentially also damages DNA and attacks enzymes. It's just that the superoxide comes from oxygen instead of water. That's the real difference, Sabrina. Yeah, Ginevra, anything – ionizing radiation is any radiation that's coming off of nuclear decay. It's radiation that allows ionization to occur. Okay. So, good news. We've done C1. We've done C2. And we've done C7. Higher level, you still need C6 and C8. Standard level will need C3 and C4 and C5, which y'all will do as well. C5 actually isn't that long. To be honest with you so um hopefully we'll be able to get that kind of done next week and then we'll be able to start revisions and talk about labs and things like that as well but so um we'll see kind of how that goes maybe not next week maybe a little bit after that but definitely before spring break okay and so again i strongly encourage you to go download the outline i have and kind of make mental check notes or physical check marks next to stuff that we've discussed those are the things the IB has explicitly stated that you should know and things that you don't need to know. So really a good guy because whenever they ask a question, if someone says that question's not fair, they'll point back to that and go, well, we stated here that you needed to know this. So they're very literal about that information. So I would strongly suggest you download that and print it off and go through kind of that outline for this as well. Okay. Uh, that's the end of the stream for today. Um, thank you all so much for um, – being a good audience and paying attention and hopefully y'all got a lot from it. I will download the video and upload it to YouTube. Um, and, um, yeah, we'll kind of move from there. And so y'all, I won't see y'all till next Tuesday. So, um, it will resume normal class on Tuesday and we'll continue lecturing. And so, um, y'all been great. Good luck on the rest of your mock exams and things like that. And, I will see y'all on Tuesday. Right. Bye. Oh, uh, yes. Go to your normal class time on um, at on Twitch as well. So I will be going the normal schedule, and I will be following that. Thank you, Poncho, for that pog champ. Oh my goodness. Remember, I have the ability to time y'all out. All right. Have a good day, y'all. Get some lunch.